So jumping into the solar system formation model using all of these clues, how do we apply these? And then I wanna talk a little bit too about exoplanetary systems and what we can learn from them about our own solar system. So here's the overall formation model. We'll discuss this in a lot more detail near the end of the term. Um, but the idea is that we start with some large nebula of, of which is a gas cloud and it has some initial rotation and there's some sort of perturbation that causes it to begin to collapse. And if you, um, you know, imagine you're an ice skater with your arms outstretched, right? And you're spinning a little bit and then you pull in your arms, you spin a lot faster, right? And you, you also get that feeling of centrifugal force that feels like, uh, you know, if you had, uh, I don't know, you're wearing a necklace, then it feels like the necklace will, you know, fly away from you, right? And so both of these effects, the um, increase in speed from uh, the conservation of angular momentum and that centrifugal force causes two things to happen. As the gas cloud collapses, it spins faster and faster and it smashes out into a flat disk. So it goes from spherical or other irregular gas cloud to organized fast spinning disk. And this is what we call a circumstellar disk because circum means around, stellar, star. So it's the disk around a star. Sometimes these are also called protoplanetary disks because that's where planets are starting to form. So as the material in this um, circumstellar disk starts to cool, then uh, different materials can freeze out uh, of their basically kind of hot soupy state. And as this happens, they stick together and form planetesimals. So planetesimals is the name of our you know, very small objects. Protoplanets are also used for larger uh, pre-planetary objects. So this process as it occurs causes you know, all the planets to sort of clear out the area around them. So this is why we get planets in distinct orbits that don't have stuff, you know, junk in between. Um, some of the junk still exists. So for example, our asteroid belt is a good example of that. Um, so whether that's an exception or a rule, that's something that we might be able to learn from other planetary systems. And then eventually as the sun's fusion ignites, then solar winds blow off all of the lighter gases in the nebula. And what we're left with is only the, uh, you know, more dense and kind of aggregated uh, planets that are left behind. Okay, so this is the overall formation model. And we can see here how the um, orbits of the planets then naturally would form in the same orbital plane, right? Um, the reason why the inner planets are a higher density material than the outer planets is because that higher density material can freeze out at a higher temperature and it's hotter near the star. So we get those rocky and metallic materials nearby, icy materials farther away. Um, so that's how the composition is related to this model. Uh, how's the structure related to this model? It's, um, as we mentioned before, all those random collisions between all these planetesimals generate heat that help to differentiate those planets. Some of these collisions also lead to exceptions to the patterns that we see in the solar system. Okay, and I think I'll have you explore those exceptions to the rules in the forum today. All right, so looking at other circumstellar disks is something we have been able to do recently. This is a gallery that's in your book. Um, there's also a telescope called ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. Uh, that has really cool pictures where you can actually see dark um, rings where planets have cleared out the material in the disks. So this is really exciting because we're looking at baby solar systems. And even better than that, we can detect exoplanets themselves. So the fully formed exoplanets in mature um, not, you know, solar systems. And one of the ways that we do this is called the transit method. And that's when if a planet can pass between you and its star, then it appears that the star's brightness dips, right? Um, so you can look for the, how frequently this dip happens and, that, and by doing that, figure out its orbital period. Uh, you can also look at the, you know, the depth of that dip and get an idea for how big the planet is uh, related to, relative to the star. We aren't always so lucky, though, to see this sort of 
um, line of sight where we're looking kind of edge on or at just a small tilt. And so there's another method, which I won't get into too much, except to say that it earned the Nobel Prize last year in physics. So the, this is called the radial velocity method. We'll talk about it if you take astronomy 122, but it's related to the Doppler shifts, the changes in frequency that we see from the star because of its gravitational interaction with its exoplanet. So this is easiest to measure for very large planets like giants. All right, and just to give you an idea of where are we actually looking for other planets, other planetary systems, um, if we look at our Milky Way galaxy, big spiral galaxy, and here's the center of the Milky Way, our solar system is out here sort of in a little spur of one of the spiral arms called Orion Spur. That's about 30,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. And here's the area that we're searching for exoplanets is within our own neighborhood. And the reason for that is because it's the easiest place to look. <laughs> There's you know, gas and dust that is in the way if you try to look most other directions. And the center of the Milky Way obscures a lot uh, because there's a, a lot of bright stars there. Um, so we can't really see this edge very well. Okay, so what I'm saying is we're looking in this area, we've found a lot so far, but there's a whole lot of galaxy left. 